Good evening and welcome to this Convergence Science <coughs> Network presentation. My name's Luan Ismahil. I'm the Executive Director of the network and it's a great pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Some new faces to discuss a very exciting area of Convergence Science, regenerative medicine. Regenerative medicine refers to the repair or replacement of human tissues and organs and does so by using cells, genes or other biological building blocks along with bioengineered materials and technologies. It's an important field of medicine with obvious convergence aspects and is the basis of treatments for the variety of conditions such as neurodegenerative disorders, diabetes, arthritis, cardiovascular disease and ageing among others. This evening we bring you three of Australia's leading regenerative medicine experts to share their research, all of whom are based at the Australian Regenerative Medicine Institute at Monash University. So the program for this evening is that each of our presenters will provide a short overview of their research. Uh, I'd like to invite Peter to come to the lectern and, uh, and address you, Peter. Okay, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I'm going to talk basically about one element of regenerative medicine uh, and when Megan and uh, Megan Muncy, thank you Megan for the invitation, approached us to talk about this, um, we talked a little bit about what might be interesting uh, for a more broad audience. So one of the fascinating aspects of regeneration is that basically we're losers. So we don't do it very well and why is that? So this is an open discussion because we don't know the answer to that question and I'm going, we're going to present three vignettes from researchers at Army who try to tackle that question in different ways. Uh, we do work very heavily in aspects of modelling human disease, looking at stem cells, but one of the bows, one of the arrows in our bow, is using the template of organisms that regenerate themselves and ask why they can do it and why we cannot, and use their processes, dissect them, and use them as a blueprint for engendering regenerative processes in our own tissues that cannot. So that's the basic premise of today's talk. And yes, we have it up. So encapsulated in these two pictures on either side of me uh, by John Singer Sargent, Sargent is, the, is the mythical or the ancient view of regeneration. Regeneration was considered an attribute that was evil or part of the world um, that mortals did not want to contend with. So here we have uh, Hercules with a Lernian Hydra and this regenerative organism had the amazing capacity if you lopped off one of its heads, two of its grew back. And so through time we viewed uh, the regenerative properties of animals or mythical creatures with somewhat of an eye of scepticism or disbelief. However, in our own um, Hydra world, it's a little less complicated than that. So here's a little less impressive organism, uh, the Hydra, which uh, is an invertebrate animal, which when you cut it any which way you like, is able to regrow its form and function from almost single cells. And this capacity is also evident in other invertebrates, such as the starfish, also uh, within planarian worms. And here we have a series of experiments where you literally dice this worm into segments. It has a complex neural network. It has stem cells within it that recapitulate the whole body pan and regrow the whole planaria, or you can fuse two elements together and make a push me pull you planaria. <laughs> right? So this is a very, when you think about how, what you would, how animals behave to wounding and injury across the phy phylogeny, you come up with a really amazing uh, difference in capacity. Of course, those in inv invertebrates, they're simple organisms, although they do have nerves, they do have muscles, they do have all the tissues in a breakdown form that perhaps we would recognise. But generally through evolution, there is a trend such that the regenerative potential of um, higher vertebrates uh, is less than it is in what's considered lower vertebrates. So I don't like the term higher and lower. These are animals that are actually evolved uniquely for each of their or ecological niches through selective pressure. But in terms of what we describe in terms of capacities, it's a simple approximation of, of the argument. So we, of course, are regenerating organisms. We do have tissues and organs that do regenerate reasonably well. Thank God one of them is the liver, otherwise half of us in this room would be dead. <laughs> the other one is blood, of course, the, the, the most fascinating and, and most highly studied set of regenerative potentials we have in our body, uh, dramatically therapeutically relevant, only bona fide stem cell treatment is bone marrow transplant. 
And it's a fabulous regenerative tissue that's been a template for understanding for regeneration for decades. And of course the skin. But as we go back towards uh, our evolutionary ancestry, we find that there are many more tissues and organs that can regenerate. So we want to try and understand why these organisms, and James will tell you uh, some stories about his favourite organisms, but also James understands or has come to grips with this, why these capacities are surveyed phylogenetically the way they are. And he's going to talk specifically about that particular sets of arguments. So he'll talk to you about his theories or the, the prevailing ideas about why, whether we are losers or whether we're not losers or whether we've gained or there's loss in the phylogenetic. And that'll be a really dramatic entree into the evolutionary part of this talk. But my favourite organism is this little creature here, which is the zebrafish. Now, the zebrafish is the fastest growing model system in biomedical research. Um, it's the second most used uh, organism after mice in research in the UK. Um, and there are several capacities that fuel that uptake. And one of them is mainly in embryology, where it was first utilised because it has a beautifully optically transparent embryo and that has fueled a lot of research that does direct live imaging in tissue. But the, other, uh, the two other features that have fueled this growth in the system is the fact that one, some aspects of its biology lended itself to, to accurately modelling some human diseases. So it's a growing human disease model. And for the reason that I've just mentioned, it can grow and regenerate many of the organs and tissues that we cannot after injury. So we use this system uh, as a regeneration machine. So we lock within the zebrafish's genetic makeup and it's a sad fact of life that we're just modified fish. The genome of the fish is not very distinct than our own. Most of the gene complement that we have is present within the fish genome. And there's nothing sure in the fossil record that we evolved from fishes. So the ancestral properties that the fish had are our ancestral properties. So understanding them is an important building block for understanding our own evolutionary capacities. So we use it as a blueprint for, for understanding regeneration. Why is it can it, it can regenerate its spinal cord? Why is it can it regenerate its cardiac tissue when we can't? And one of the great attributes is that within a relatively modest facility, we can have a large number of fish. Any of you have heard, had a home aquarium at home? Know that you can cram the little buggers into <laughs> quite a, a small tank and you can do that. means we have a great genetic resolution with the system. We can survey the genome in a four genetic way, a very successful paradigm for a lot of organisms to define gene functions, particularly in a regenerative sense. And the other capacity here, it's optical clarity. And the first two days of the zebrafish's life is in this little window here. Very simple movie, but you really can't make that movie of any other organism. You can't take one cell and watch it grow into an organism in a dish. And this is a relatively underappreciated attribute of the system. So all the phases of life of which we're a direct Paralogues to us, gastrulation, segmentation, organogenesis, neurulation, they all occur in real time under the, well that's not how fast it goes, that's two days. <laughs> that would be good, wouldn't it? They all will occur in this little embryo, very similarly to they do for us. Okay, the topic. Okay, so we know if we lop off a fin of a fish, it can, gr it can grow back. Now that's a simple statement, but within the fin itself is a complex network of uh, anatrichia, lepidotrichia, cells, skin, and then we can use that to look for a gene that's, that's required for regeneration and screening. Very simple. Well, fish fins, we've got limbs, not very impressive. Perhaps more impressive is the fact if you take the spinal cord of a zebrafish and you do a full resection injury, and this is what's happened on here on the left. These are just images looking down on the, on the spinal cord of the fish after it's been severed. You'll see that over time, both the supporting cells and the neurons grow back and reverse the site of the resection. This is an amazing feature. So here's the poor little chap here, down in the bottom left-hand window here. He's not moving, but that's not because the movie's not playing. <laughs> so here he is after spinal cord resection. Not a happy chap. His uh, resection is at the back, just at the, at the region here. He can't move any of his trunk muscles because there's a full resection of the vertebrae. About six weeks later, this animal, although not perfect in its locomotion, has now been able to move nearly every element of its, its uh, musculature posterior to the restriction zone. And if you look in the larval setting, 
You can see all the cells that don't do the regeneration very well in a fish, in a, a mammal, do it so beautifully in the zebrafish. So we've made discoveries using this animal um, to try and understand why it is that these cell patterns occur. And we've come up with a protein that specifically uh, is expressed on these cells that drives this regenerative potential. So rather than these cell, green cells here, acting as a block to the regenerative potential of neurons, it actually forms these beautiful tram tracks over which these neurons will traverse, completely opposite to what happens in spinal cord resection in mammals. And this is all fueled by a particular protein called FTF. And we've been able to show now by isolating uh, this protein and showing it works in fish and now injecting it into the mouse that increases the regenerative capacity of the spinal cord lesion in humans. So that's the track we're hoping to travel and uh, try to use the blueprint within the fish to engender therapeutic potential in our cells. So that's an illustration from my own lab. Um, but perhaps one maybe a little closer to home. Um, nearly everybody knows somebody who has had issues uh, with cardiac tissue or uh, heart attacks or remodeling. Um, and we know that basically the cardiac cells themselves uh, undergo these repeated contractions uh, due to forced loading. And in, in aspects of, of um, poor diet, the increasing load of diabetes, heart disease will be an increasing problem and, and uh, for the Western world. So uh, we know that these particular contractions are fueled by calcium waves uh, along the sarcomeric bands. And it's this distension or uh, um, dysregulation of this process that often leads to cardiac remodeling. So when we have a heart attack, that's not a good situation. Cardiac cells cannot repair themselves at the wound site. And that would be one of the major achievements of regenerative medicine if even a modest recurring of the uh, scarring or remodeling of that area into uh, beating cardiomyocytes was occurred. So the problem in cardiac medicine, I'm not a cardiologist, this is a, a, a vignette for someone else's research, <laughs> is that we have 300,000 people in end stage heart failure a year and we only have eight tra 80 transplants. So it's a fairly stark equation. So the humble little fish steps into this is because you can actually take its heart and it's a two chambered heart. It's a simpler structure rather than the four, but it has an atrium and a ventricle. If you resect one third of the ventricle, if you did that to us, we'd die immediately. We'd sanguinate into our body cavities. The fish forms an immediate clot and regrows its cardiomyocytes and it uh, produces normal function. So there's a normal scar that forms, that's what would happen, this blue stuff forms, the scar at the tip of the resection zone, but after 60 days, it's completely healed. So how does that really work? So here's a little cartoon of our zebrafish swimming happily in the Ganges River Basin where they come from, isolated and under, about to undergo the surgical procedure I've described. So it has a simple circulatory system, this two-chambered heart, uh, and the heart works and is electrically coupled in exactly the same way. And soon we'll have, you can see the heart flowing around here, and here comes the steady hand of the surgeon and coming in with a resection uh, knife. Don't worry, no fish were harmed in the making of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> here we go, dramatic. Gasp of breath, a little bleeding and sanguination. The clot forms immediately. This is the stage that occurs in us. Um, we form clots, uh, fibrin-associated clots, collagen-associated clots, and that's where it stops with us. So in, and then there's remodeling of the heart as it tries to beat with the loss of its cardiomyocytes, and this leads to uh, cardiomyopathy and problems in heart disease. But in the fish, we first have this layer that surrounds the heart, the epicardium growing around the scar. We have uh, cells invading and regrowing and releasing signals from around the clot zone and it manages uh, to dissolve aspects of the clot. The epicardium is a very special layer in, in the heart uh, in zebrafish and it's a signaling zone. And so it, it triggers um, gene expression all around itself at the zone of injury and it, it actually responds to signals that are secreted from the cardiomyocytes as they re-enter the cell cycle. Now this re-entry of the cell cycle of a cardiomyocyte never occurs in a mammal, as far as we're aware, uh, except in one instance in neonatal mice. I think James might even talk about that. So signals from the epicardium are released. Um, this drives a process of vascular genesis. 
which is very important for maintaining the cardiomyocytes within the heart. Um, these signals are moving into the cardio, the pink tissue, the cardiomyocytes, and here's the revascularization of the, the cardiomyocytes itself. And we've had further repeating of the process. So we have then have a totally remodeled and rebuilt heart, which allows the fish to swim away and be perfectly happy. So basically the idea, and this is taken up by some of the drug companies in, in the UK, is that we can't regenerate our heart, but we should protect it by buying their drug, like Lipitol or Lipidil in this case, a statin. Of course, our approach of this would be zebrafish can regenerate its heart and we can't, we should listen to it and do what it does. <laughs> so there are a couple of vignettes where, where we stand with some research directions. They're just illustrations of how you can use regenerative organisms. As I said, our institute uses a variety of paradigms and tools, stem cells, mammalian non-regenerative paradigms, direct human disease modeling uh, to understand the regenerative process, but this is just one angle. And as we move into the next phase of the talk, which will be by James, we can take up the idea of whether we've lost these capacities and we really are the big L losers in evolution and why we've lost them and what's driven that. Or maybe it's not quite as simple as that. Maybe these have been gained through evolution in some lineages. And I think this is a fascinating uh, particular area that we can delve into. So if you're interested in more about the Regenerative Medicine Institute, we have a, a newsletter that comes out twice a year. I've left a few copies up there. Um, if you want to subscribe, let us know. And if you want to know more about what we do or you want to visit the Institute, please get in touch with me um, through what's in the newsletter and I'd be happy to see you there. So I think I'm going to go straight over to James because he's going to actually move straight into from my talk. My name's James Godwin. I work at Army and I primarily work on the salamander looking at heart and limb regeneration. And that's, uh, I work on this guy. And uh, today I'm not really going to talk in, in great detail about my research at Army, but what I will talk about is this, this question of why some salamanders or why some animals can regenerate and why others can't. And Pete's given you a really good introduction on, on some of the examples of regeneration amongst the animal kingdom. And what really is striking is that amongst the animal kingdom there are examples in many different phyla of animals that can regenerate or replace large sections of their body plan or after injury uh, in many different ways. So obviously we have the sea star that can, can regenerate their appendages through the local proliferation. Uh, Pete showed you about the hydra where you cut it in half, you get two small hydras that then through morphalaxis rearranging all the cells to make two small hydra that, which eventually grow to big hydra. Uh, the flatworm, which uses like a stem cell, which migrates to the site of injury and then proliferates and replaces all the tissue that's, that's missing. And then you have things like cockroaches that regenerate limbs by what is thought to be a process of forming a pool of progenitor cells right at the amputation plane. And interestingly, this is very similar to what you would find in a salamander, which is a vertebrate, except it happens in the opposite direction. Differentiation and repatterning happens in the opposite direction, indicating that it's evolved separately. Now, amongst vertebrates, it's far more rare to find examples of regeneration, especially in, in adulthood. And uh, one of the heroes of regeneration is this guy, the salamander. Now, obviously it's the only example of vertebrate limb regeneration, but there are a laundry list of other structures that can be regenerated in adult tissues, such as the, the tail, the heart, the spinal cord, the brain, other organs such as the spleen, parts of the eye, and even uh, <coughs> sexual organs. Uh, and Pete's talked to you about some of the clinically relevant structures in other organisms like zebrafish. And as we move up into uh, other organisms such as lizards, they're far more restricted in their ability to regenerate. And they only really can regenerate things like tails. They can't do limbs. And when they regenerate the tail, it's, it's relatively poor in its ability to recapitulate the original tissue. Uh, there are examples uh, few and far between uh, in the bird uh, clade and uh, this is the, the male puffin that can replace part of its beak after, after mating, the end of the mating season. And there are also examples of, of sexually hormonally induced regeneration in things like deer. And so this is really the only tangible example of adult mammalian sort of epimorphic regeneration. 
And uh, so what we really see is that there really is uh, a sort of a, a dropping off of regenerative capacity in mammalian uh, type of organisms. However, if we look very, very early in development in things like mice and, and, and humans, we find that we have an enhanced ability to repair tissues scar-free and in some cases regenerate. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but this seems to be progressively lost throughout development. So by the time you reach adulthood, that regenerative capacity disappears. And so this seems to be inversely correlated with the sort of sophistication of your immune system. So as your immune system develops and becomes more mature, this seems to be uh, opposing regeneration in many, many contexts. Now one graphic example of this is the neonatal, neonatal mouse heart. So just one day after birth, mice have the ability to regenerate uh, their heart tissue after resection. So you can cut off a significant portion of the heart ventricle uh, and that will regenerate scar-free. Uh, but if you do the same experiment within seven days, at the, closer to the seven day time point, you lose that ability to replace that tissue and you get fibrous uh, tissue or scarring, uh, which really impairs heart function and usually leads to death. Now, if we look at where adult regeneration of the heart sits in the animal kingdom, what we really find, in vertebrates especially, what we find is that it seems to be sort of uh, not sort of dotted around different, different uh, branches throughout evolution. So what we find is that the salamander can regenerate both its heart and its, and its limbs throughout its life, but the frog can't regenerate its heart. And, it, and although it's an amphibian, it can't regenerate its limb after metamorphosis. And when you look in, at animals such as the ray fin fish, you find that zebrafish can regenerate its heart and other structures throughout life, but a very closely related animal, the madaka fish, can't. So there seems to be some sort of variation in the ability to regenerate within those, those very minor evolutionary changes in branches. Now, this brings up a really important question of whether regeneration is actually an ancestral trait uh, that's been lost during evolution in, 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 in as much as saying is that we're losers in evolution, that we may have just lost it and uh, one of our ancestors had it. Or there's also the alternative hypothesis <coughs> that something may have been acquired in particular branches of evolution that give that <coughs> particular animal an advantage. And uh, I'll I'll give you some of the evidence that's emerging on that particular theme in a moment. Now, when we look at the, the amphibians, what we find is that they all emerged from a common ancestor roughly about 300 million years ago um, in the Carboniferous period and pre-Permian period. And what we find is that they've all sort of become very specialist in, in competition with each other. They've developed adaptive uh, traits specific for their environment that make them very different in their body plan. And a salamander looks very different to a frog. Um, but when we look at the frog in particular, the, the Xenopus frog, what we find is that it's developed this really sophisticated adaptive immune response, which really only emerges at the point of metamorphosis. So when it leaves the tadpole stage and becomes a, a frog, you get all of the hormonal changes and the de developmental changes, but you also get this really uh, massive development in its immune system. And this sort of correlates with this red area here where you lose the ability to regenerate limbs. And this is correlative, but uh, you also find that later on in, the, in life in the, in the frog that you get a lack of scar-free repair later in life, um, sort of along the lines of when you get um, a mature immune system. But in very stark contrast, what we find is in the salamander, they maintain scar-free wound healing and regeneration throughout their life. And they don't really have a very advanced adaptive immune response. So this brings up a question that, you know, does, is it possible that frogs have developed a sophisticated adaptive immune response at the expense of regeneration? And that could be something that actually impedes regeneration in humans. So that's worth investigating. But there is also another possibility. And recent evidence on a molecule that I used to work in, on in London 
uh, called PROD1, shows that this molecule uh, is potentially involved in the local evolution of mechanisms that underlie limb regeneration. So the salamanders are the only tetrapod capable of limb regeneration, and they're the only group that express this molecule called PROD1, which sits on the cell surface and is involved in limb regeneration. It seems to be a very salamander-specific protein, and it has no orthologs in frogs, or fish, or in other mammals. And it seems to have evolved from a protein that's very closely related in structurally, like this almost like a, like a scaffold, if you like, which is recycled throughout evolution. But originally, it's very closely related to a snake neurotoxin. And it's this little alpha helix here, shown in red, that has been swapped <coughs> over and has applied a new function to this protein. Now, when we look at all of the salamanders alive today on planet Earth, we find that they all express PROD1. Uh, and so that's quite remarkable because they've all shown regeneration so far. And to add to that, uh, a curiosity has emerged in that they recently found a fossil that seems to be from the basal Permian region, which is about 300 million years ago, which is one of the very early salamander ancestors uh, that seems to have undergone a regeneration event because regeneration patterns in a slightly different way to actually development in the limb structures. So we can tell from the fossil that it was halfway through regeneration. We can't see the cartilage that, that was halfway through regeneration, but we can see that it's possible that this animal did regenerate too. And that brings up a question of whether or not uh, that ancestor had prod one and then it was lost in frogs, or that it may have actually uh, just emerged quite late in that salamander branch. Now, there is other evidence for the local evol evolution of regenerative capacity from other regenerative species. Now, you've had a brief introduction to the hydra, and this amazing organism is, uh, comes from a family of animals that is very closely related to, uh, to the starlet sea anemone. And these, are, these have diverged in evolution fairly recently. And one has the ability to regenerate, the hydra, and this starlet sea anemone is a very poor regenerator. And they share a large portion of the genetic material. But from the Holstein lab in Germany, this paper has just come out and it, it basically shows that when you study in really extreme detail the proteomics and transcriptomics of what happens in the hydra, you find that very early in regeneration, a whole set of genes is activated that seems to be quite new in evolution, that is not present in this very closely related species. And this set of new genes, based on measured by its repetitive sequence uh, identity, which gives an, a measure of, of uh, how late this, this set of genes emerged, seems to be only associated with the early part of regeneration and the late part of regeneration uses the more ancestral genes which are also present in this particular species. So this opens up the possibility that there is this specific regeneration cluster of genes that is activated specifically in this species, giving it a new function to be able to regenerate. And when you look at those genes, they're smaller in their intron size, that's smaller in the bit that usually on the piece of DNA which can sort of modify the expression levels of a gene. And they have a higher number of transposable elements or called TEs. And these are kind of like viral insertions. They're very closely related to viral insertions. And they're very mobile genetic elements that can jump. And this is very common in the plant world where, where genes can jump between plants and give, new, give particular plants new characteristics from other plants. But this also happens in, in humans, and it's expected that we have about 50% of our genome littered with transposable elements. And what's really striking about this data is that it's been quite baffling for us in the salamander field for a while, that after you uh, amputate a limb, you get a large increase in these transposable elements and line elements, these two kind of mobile genetic elements that are specifically associated with regeneration. So this is really sort of uh, igniting our imagination that maybe regeneration is something that could be locally evolved and maybe we could understand that this is something that's, that, that could be hijacked 
because if it can, if it can be uh, mobile, we might be able to introduce that into humans. So what does this mean for promoting regeneration in humans? Well, it's been quite clear for some time that the approach of comparing regenerative organisms with non-regenerative organisms could provide us with a template, if you like, of how they do it, how salamanders and how fish can regenerate in a vertebrate system, and maybe how we could modify our genes or our cellular processes to become more like them. And is that possible? Well, there is some examples in the literature and uh, from Helen Blau's lab at Stanford a few years ago, they showed that if you take a mouse cell or a mammalian cell like ours, that normally can't go back into the cell cycle because it has a particular protein that, that, that is a backup protein to, uh, to block cell cycle re-entry. And you remove one of the proteins to make it more similar to the, to the newt or the salamander, you can make that cell behave and be activated or stimulated like the newt. So by copying or if you like studying organisms that can regenerate, we might be able to modify uh, our cells to respond in a similar way to the salamander. And then of course, uh, the whole idea that there are regeneration specific proteins that have evolved throughout evolution that can be used to activate these processes uh, brings up the whole potential for cross species biopharmaceuticals. This is an emerging field and so far there's been a few examples uh, one of them you may have heard of, uh, it's in the diabetes space, uh, Bieta, a new drug that's designed from lizard spit that is used in, in, what, in, in, in controlling diabetes in one of my friends, actually. So, so this, this sounds like science fiction, using lizard spit to, to control diabetes in humans, but this is actually in the clinic and FDA approved. And uh, there are other examples closer to home uh, in the salamander. There are molecules that have been identified in the salamander that allow this rapid migration of the skin cells, the epithelial cells, to close wounds quicker. And that's major, what, what's thought to be a major component to their scar-free wound healing, the fact that they can close a wound very, very quickly and allow that process, that wound healing process to take place. And so this is quite exciting if we can harness some of these molecules and, and in, the clinical, in a clinical scenario, activate epithelial closure and, and then look at all of the other aspects that they have advantages over us to regenerate. And uh, even closer to home uh, is a molecule that I work on um, within the anterior gradient protein family that we discovered back in 2007. What we've found is that throughout evolution uh, there are additional family members within the anterior gradient protein family. Uh, there is a, a gain of an anterior gradient protein uh, in the fish, in the zebrafish, and uh, that could actually be involved in, in cardiac regeneration, for instance, and is expressed in, in cardiac regeneration in the fish. Uh, but in the salamander, we've got two additional family members. And so I've been working pretty hard to look at whether or not these proteins actually work on human cells or mouse cells, and they do. They all have different effects on different cells within the mouse. Uh, heart and more importantly uh, it's been shown that the anterior gradient protein from the newt can downregulate collagen in human fibroblasts which are within our skin and also downregulate collagen and improve wound healing outcomes in a rabbit ear uh, fibrosis model. So these molecules do work on, on mammalian tissues and it's going to be an exciting few years to try and develop that into by, uh, cross species biopharmaceuticals. So basically, we are working pretty hard to try and understand what it is that makes salamanders and other regenerative species so good at regenerating, and really uh, trying to unravel that mystery so that we could someday bring that to the clinic and improve our potential for regeneration. So thank you for your attention. So my name is Mirana, and I've just been recruited at Army last year, actually, as the head of a developmental systems biology. So my discipline is pretty much computational biology linked with development and evolution. So why, where, do my, where does my research fit in this picture? So we really believe that you know, one way to answer 
how an organ regenerates is first of all to understand how it, form, it forms at first place. Because I always take this analogy of a car. If your car breaks down, if you want to repair it, if you don't know the components, if you don't know the part, you actually can't repair or can't you know, uh, fix what's, what's the problem. So in my laboratory, in this, in this view of being able to regenerate an organ, what we want to do at first place is to understand all the, how the organ forms. And you would think that with years and years and work on developmental biology, on embryology, we would know how this process works, and you'll be surprised how much we don't know about where we come from and how we're made, basically. So because of all what Pete and James have shown you, how the heart is really a great model for regeneration, we choose the heart to study its development and try to understand how the heart develops. So you, I don't need to tell you how important the heart is for, for us, but you'd be surprised how much we don't know how the heart forms at first place. So I don't know if many of you knew that before having this beautiful structure that we all see in pictures, the heart actually started as this crescent, as you can see here. So I'll show you some video to really illustrate how from that simple structure, we, go, we, start, we, we obtain this nice, beautiful three-dimensional three structure that is the heart. So first of all, the heart, as I told you, is after a few weeks of development, it forms this tubular structure which can be illustrated here. So this is actually what's happening in mammalian, so in mouse and humans, and this is what's happening in chicken, it's quite similar. So what you can see here is that you have these veins that are going to be actually the future hearts. They are on each side of the future embryo, and what they're going to do is they're going to fuse and merge together to form a tube. So it's a very highly dynamic process. What's happening once this tube is formed, as you can see here, so that would be the tube that you can see here, is that tube is going to loop. So this is just an illustration of what's happening in the looping. So not only the cells have moved and have merged, but now like, you know, like what you have these balloons that the people try and, 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 and you know, switch around and, and fold and etc. So this is exactly what's happening in the heart. You have a big remodeling process that's happening that's going to form the chambers of the heart and form this beautiful structure that we can see here eventually. So from this process, you have the future ventricle <coughs> and the atria that are forming. And then eventually the last step will be the septation of the heart where you can have your left ventricle, left atria, red ventricle and red atria. The reason why I'm showing all this is I hope by now you've appreciated our complexities. And this is one of the reasons why we don't know why or what are the molecules that actually control the formation of the heart. And why this is important, it's because when you have heart disease, there are, there are a lot of things that can go wrong during this process. If you have just one single molecule that's misexpressed or something's going wrong, then you'll have a defect in this process and you have a malfunctioning heart. And as a matter of fact, there are a lot of troubles associated with the heart malfunction or genes that are involved in heart malfunction. In Australia, it's known that one baby out of 100 is actually born with a heart defect. And that's probably due to one of the processes here that went wrong. And what is really striking about this disease is there are no current treatment. The only treatment available for these babies is to have heart transplant or heart surgery. So you can see why it's really urgent to have an understanding of why this disease occurs, because as I told you, we don't even know how the heart forms or what are the molecules involved in heart formation. And if these defects are mild, uh, these babies can survive for adulthood, but then might, might be, su be suffering from early um, heart attacks, for example. So it actually affects all the different layers of the population. So what we do, so we've, we've talked about evolution. So I wanted to just show you how we can actually link disease evolution and development together. So Peter and James have already given you a flavor of how we can understand regeneration through evolution by using a whole range of organisms. So in my laboratory, what we've noticed is that when you look at this different stage of heart development in a mammalian system, it actually reminded us of what's happening during evolution. So this is an illustration of that. So if I ask you, do you know whether flies have a heart? I'm not sure if you would know that they have, but they do. And actually, fly heart looks like this. So there's a debate whether it's called a heart. In my books, it's, called, it's a heart because it's just a simple tube that pumps. So that's, for me, good enough to be a heart. <laughs> and uh, it's very similar to that stage 
when we are three, a few weeks old in the, in the womb of our mummies, well, it's just a simple tube that pumps. And that's exactly very similar to what's happening when we're a baby. In fish, when you go further up in evolution, as Pete and James have shown you, the fish is actually a two-chamber heart. You only have a ventricle and an atrium. <coughs> and this is very similar to what we see at this stage of development in mammalian, where you still have just one ventricle and one atria. And you can see where I'm going here. When you look at frog, they actually have three chambers. So they still have only one ventricle, but the atria have further divided. And then when we reach mammalians, we have a beautiful four-chambered heart. So you can see the parallel here. As we go through development, you go from one, two, three, <coughs> and four-chambered heart. And this is very reminiscent of what's happening during evolution when you go from a one, two, three, and four-chambered heart. So if you want to address how the heart forms or how the heart regenerates, because Peter and James have beautifully demonstrated to you that these are really champions of regeneration, can we actually compare all of these stages together and then we can find what's present in one species that's absent in the other and the other way around as well. What's, abs what's present in the other that's not present in, the, uh, that's present in the other. So how do we do that? So what we're really concentrating in the lab is to look in at genes. So James has shown you some examples of genes that could be uh, you know, the ones that we can use to regenerate. But from a computational point of view, we're always thinking, why can't we just look at all the genes? So it's a very, very modest aim. But when you come from a computer pers perspective, you, you, you bring this aspect, which is we can do everything, which is what we call systems biology. And I think we are able to say that now, which is very, very, um, it's, it's a very ambitious aim. But we have the technology now to do so. And I'll, bring, I'll come to that later on. So our aim is to find the genes that would be specific in mammalian that would actually bring this evolution from one, two to three chamber hearts to four chamber hearts eventually. So we look at the genes in all these different species. And what did we see? There are no mammalian specific genes. All the genes that we know are resp responsible for heart development are conserved in all these different species. They are exactly the same from the mouse to the fly. For example, here, ge this gene here is, very, is well known to be involved in heart development. If this gene NKX 2.5 is missing, the heart cannot form. And the gene has its homologue in fly, which is called Tinman from the wizard or also, because if you don't have Tinman in fly, <laughs> the fly doesn't have a heart. So all these genes are present in all these species, but we know that they're all different. There is there's a move from one, two to three chamber heart. So where is the difference? Where does the difference lie from? And here comes the challenge. We know that genes, they only compose 3% of our genome. What's in the 97%? And this has been ignored for decades. And what we know is contained contain in this 95% of the genome is what regulates the gene. Ultimately, the genes have to be, these genes have to be expressed at a specific time and at, at a specific location in the embryo. But we don't know what controls the expression of the gene. And I think where we're going in the future is to really dwell into this gene regulation space, look into what regulates the genes, which is contained in the 97% of our genome. So this is where bioinformatics and system biology come into place. In 2001, the genome ODC started. The goal is, can we sequence the entire genome? Because we, there, is th there are things in there that we, for sure we don't know about. There are only 20,000 genes. Are these, the number of, are these the total number of genes that we know of? What is the sequence of the human genome? So it was really this exploratory um, research which involved several libraries on different continents and millions and millions of dollars. But it was successful. So in 2001, this was a milestone. You know that the first draft of the human genome has been published. And this was really the first time that we have a complete knowledge of the sequence of the human genome. What did we find? Well, what we found is that we found the location of all the genes. The, gene, the number of genes always varies, but that's a different question, but about 30, uh, 20 to 30,000 genes. And we also know the sequence of the rest of the genome that's not composed by genes. But we still didn't have any knowledge of what's happening in the rest of these sequences. And therefore, it's been referred as junk DNA. So for on, what happened is another re revolution, which was the sequencing technologies. 
So this is 2001, when the first genome has been published. As I told you, it cost it hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. As you can see here, when you move back very quickly, you can see there was a drop, a dramatic drop in the cost of sequencing. So today, it, co it costs actually less than $1,000 to sequence an entire genome. So with this dramatic drop in the, in the sequencing cost, you can imagine that it's, it's been really empowering the discovery of the function of the rest of the 97th person of the genome. And this is basically the next revolution. And about 10 years later, so very recently, the first map of the non-coding regions of the genome has been released. And this is for me the next breakthrough because now we know what's happening in that junk DNA portion of the genome. And so this was the picture we had after the first genome was sequenced. And I don't want to scare you, but this is how it looks like right now. <laughs> so you're not meant to, to you know, remember everything that is in slide. All, what, all what's happening is very complex and there is a lot of data that's coming. So it feels like we have now a good understanding of all the genes that are present in the genome, but we also know, have all the information about what actually regulates the gene and what ele other elements are present in the genome to control the expression of these genes. So the analogy I can take is if before was like 2001 and Space Odyssey, it was very exploratory, it was very nice. The new data that we obtained <laughs> in 2012 looked more like a catastrophe movie. Why is that? because we have so much data, we don't know how to deal with this. And this is what I called the sequencing revolution had to come with a bioinformatics revolution to be able to basically build a wall to treat, integrate, and analyze all this data. So this is basically where my research fit in, is to crunch all this data set to be able to extract information. Because it's one good thing to be able to get all the information that you want, but you also should be able to analyze it. So to bring all of this back and to summarize it in the general picture that we're doing at Army in terms of regeneration, evolution, and development, what we do at the moment, we, we are sequencing all these different hearts from all these different organisms. Because what we want to know is to find all the genes and the regulatory elements associated with these genes that control these different processes in all these different organisms. So you can already imagine the kind of data set that we obtain. We have lots of lots of sequences to analyze and our overall goal is to find, as I mentioned in the beginning, the process that come on and the process that are different as well. So we have bioinformatics integrated in the laboratory where we have computational biologists that analyze the data and reconstruct the network or the, the association between the genes that actually control these different processes. And as I've shown you, it's not just about the gene, but most importantly, about the regulatory elements. And that's going to be the next challenge as well, because it's easy to identify this element, but their function is still very unknown. So we know where, where they are located, but how do they act to regulate the gene is still also another challenge. And finally, of course, we want to bring it back to the disease mechanism because our ultimate goal is if we can understand how or which genes are involved in this process or which networks are involved in this transition, we can understand better when we have a baby who, for example, in the case of the hypoplastic left heart syndrome, doesn't have a left ventricle. You could say, well, actually in a frog, we know that the process stops there. So what is missing there to, go it, to bring it to the next step? So with that, I hope I've given you a bit of overview of how we can use evolution, bioinformatics, and in, in the context of regeneration and heart development. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, I'd now like to invite Associate Professor Megan Munsey to uh, moderate the Q&A with our panel. Uh, Professor Munsey is the, the Head of Education, Ethics, Law and Community Awareness. A unit at the Australia Research Council funded Stem Cell Australia initiative. Uh, Megan's well known for her expertise in stem cell science, regularly provides advice to researchers, academics, politicians and the uh, wider community and has an academic interest in stem cell tourism. Please welcome Megan. Thanks a lot. Is about so, ten past? Welcome you guys back. Yep. So I think it's a nice small room, so we can easily hear. I have to ask the first question, as is my privilege. I need to know more about lizard spit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just fascinated by the cross-species 
biopharmaceuticals, and, and is that, that must be a very new field, is it? I'm yeah, yeah. I'm going to come yeah. around so you don't have to look at me. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think there's about 12 new drugs in the pipeline currently, uh, but that's the one that's made it to the FDA this, this year. I think, uh, and, and that's through the regulatory process. Absolutely. So, really? so obviously, this has been in the pipeline for twenty years, uh, and it's just a matter of, of getting the, you know, the, the community to take that on board and embrace it. But I think the, the thing is that lizard spit actually works by um, activating a whole bunch of receptors on human cells uh, to regulate the hormonal imbalance in diabetes. So yeah, it, it works great, and it's a life-saving treatment. A question. Yes, sir. Um, in regards to the regeneration immune dichotomy, which is more energy efficient? Or is that the prism that you need to look at? Uh, efficient is an interesting word. And it's a big counter view because well, in the rest of the world, that which is more efficient leaves you resources to do something else. Sure, sure. Resources are one thing. I think really, uh, from my perspective, it's about which is the most dominant pressure. So really, the only thing that matters in life, I think I learnt this in Year 11 Biology, is that the meaning of life is to live long enough to reproduce, basically. Yeah. And uh, if you achieve that goal, then you pass on your genes and you're successful. So the salamanders have a particular uh, vested interest in keeping their limbs because part of their life cycle involve a little bit of a headlock uh, and a little bit of external fertilization and uh, a bit of a bit of chasey and and then the female has to like put the eggs on like pondweed like tinsel on a Christmas tree and that allows airflow and a lack of you know fungal infection on the on the eggs so it's really advantageous if you've got your arms uh, in in perfect work, working order so that your offspring have a chance at life. And I suppose that's a good selective pressure. But if you look at humans, I gather that most of, I gather you could probably reproduce with one arm uh, if you're, you know, dashing enough. And, yeah, and, and, <laughs> and, 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 and we've reproduced when we're 20, 30, 30. Sure. I'm a bit past, so I'm here to work out how to get my black hair back. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. If you're looking at my contribution as a human, mm -hmm. how much am I contributing at that stage and how much am I contributing now? And sure. is, is it better that I've got a better immune response right now? Well, biology probably doesn't really care about you after you've reproduced. <laughs> it just wants you to get through your teens. And, and I, one major factor that we all forget is we live in a, in a world full of antibiotics and full of hospitals that uh, you know, save people's life on a daily basis. Where if you were born 100 years ago and you got a nasty infection, you probably wouldn't survive. And so the immune system is a very dominant pressure um, keeping you alive in your, your juvenile years. And if you, if there's a lot of selective pressure to, to develop a very strong and adaptive immune response so that you can combat all of the environmental pathogens around you. If, if you don't achieve that, then you don't get to reproduce. Thank you. Next question. Does that mean in the axolotl or the of fish and all the um, organisms that are more, um, that are less immune centered and more um, regenerative centered, that, that they have less need for immune systems? That they are, are they less challenged by immune systems than other organisms? Do they live in like sterile bubble-like environments where there are no bubbles? It's a fantastic question. Uh, so we don't really know much about the salamander immune system. I've, I've spent the last few years trying to uh, generate that information. Uh, but what we do know is they have a very strong innate immune system. So these are macrophages and, and neutrophils that gobble up bacteria and, and fungus and stuff like that. That's probably the dominant pathogen within their environment. Now, I must say that they are very, very sensitive to viruses. Uh, frogs can survive viral infection relatively easily, uh, but salamanders, they all drop dead. So there is a, there is a downside to regeneration or, or a, a lack of an adaptive immune response. Uh, but we need to, you know, and the macrophages they have seem to be poised and primed to promote regeneration. And one of the questions that we have is why their macrophages are so good at promoting regeneration and why human macrophages or mouse macrophages potentially play an inhibitory role in some circumstances and whether or not we can disable that. 
in a clinical scenario. Yeah, it's a really uh, exciting avenue that you, it's the immune system is something we know a lot about in humans and we have a lot of <coughs> arsenal to put against that and if it's as simple as tinkering with timing and cell type at, at injury then that would be an amazing outcome. <coughs> I have a question. I loved all of your talks. Thank you. Um, so I think about ev evolutionary constraints as in, in sort of vertebrate mammals is basically shutting the door, right, to regeneration. Right, and so the problems we're trying to solve are really trying to overcome those really interesting constraints, um, or whatever we want to call them. And and you know we work in the auditory system, of course, where uh, birds have natural regeneration for 30 years. Scientists have tried to regenerate cure cells, mm -hmm. and it's it's flopped, right? I mean, it, it may happen one day, but it seems that the the auditory system in in mammals is rejecting these attempts at regeneration. Well, fish um, have a very sophisticated regenerative yeah, response. Yeah, I mean, the zebrafish, you know, and, and yeah. some, some and, and the avian species have these beautiful mm. regenerative structures or, or genetics, and then it's just not <coughs> happening, you know, in the mammal. Um, so I'm just wondering, sort of, my, my concern is always, you know, are we, as, no pun intended, but swimming upstream you know, <laughs> uh, in, in that attempt. Go so in defense of regenerative medicine, uh, I, I would say that most of the model organisms that can regenerate have not really been explored mm -hmm. on a molecular level. Mm -hmm. the, the salamander doesn't have a genome sequenced. Uh, the zebrafish had, you know, has got a sequence. Um, it was fairly poor, it's getting better. Uh, you, know, you know, so these are, these are kind of the, the scenarios that really regeneration hasn't gone to that next molecular level and yeah. now it can. Mm -hmm. And so these approaches can actually start to answer some of those questions because as you said, it, like trying to, to sort of, you know, build a, rebuild a car when you don't know how it was built in the first place is, is a bit silly. And trying to induce regeneration when you don't right. actually know how regeneration works in an organism that does it well. Miranda, do you want yeah, to comment I, on this? It's a really good point. And I was just talking about genomics actually, but this whole omics field, so proteomics and metabolomics that would allow to unbiasedly, when I said we want to find everything, it's, it's now possible, but it's a very good point that it's actually just the beginning. So we just realized that now we have the technology, but we'll have to wait just a couple of years or five years to be able to find the whole and the complete picture. And then, and then it's going to be interesting to find this is the molecule, or actually what I believe is there's probably not a molecule for regeneration, but rather a network mm -hmm. of molecules that actually, because that's what's happening in development. You don't have one single gene that forms a heart. You actually have a network of genes. And if you twinkle each gene individually, you might not see something happening, but maybe in regeneration, when you induce a whole network, then you can see a regenerative process. So yeah. Yeah, that level of you know, um, knowledge is going to come, but we're not there yet. So you had a question? Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. I enjoyed it enormously. Um, this, is, this may be slightly a, a left field question, and that is many of the mechanisms that you discussed are, are genetic, as what, what some have described as bottom-up mechanisms, essentially. Uh, some have argued, I'm thinking here of Mike Levin at Tufts University, have argued for uh, top-down processes, in part mediated by uh, spatial distribution of transmembrane potential and tight junctions, where they can in turn act as gene regulators, essentially top-down processes, and they are, he argues that they play a crucial role in morphogenesis, etc. Uh, and, and there is the observation that the uh, regenerative capacity of tissues seems to be correlated with the transmembrane potential. So, for example, liver cells tend to have a lower transmembrane potential cancer cells even lower again, uh, neurons, muscle cells, much higher transmembrane. So I'm just wondering if you care to comment on the role of bioelectric field structures, in, endogenous ones, uh, in, in regenerative capacity. Well, muscle's an interesting one, uh, yeah. and it, 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 of course, has is, have its own potential, which is required for its function, but it, it's known that it has its own bioelectric field, and there are people studying, because that is a regenerative tissue, whether that's part of the regenerative potential. Um, and whether cells, when injured, set off waves of uh, you know, electric fields which are sensed. So I, the short answer to the question is it's a fascinating area, but nobody knows. I mean, there's some very interesting 
um, information in wounding. You can wound and it sends off cal waves of calcium uh, across the tissue which senses the immune system senses and then as we've heard that's a very important component of, of, of either preventing or allowing regeneration to occur. So um, certainly a cell's electric potential could be a very um, uh, fine tool to sense its state and whether it needs to enter or call in the cavalry or enter a regenerative uh, state. But basically the overall cues that trigger re-entry into the cell cycle, say in the cardiomyocytes of the fish heart, in the, the cells of the skin, uh, in the newt limb regeneration, which is what James has been working on for years, are really not defined. And that is kind of the holy grail. And mm. Apart from lizard spit, if you could have you know, a zebrafish heart juice, you could rub on your heart and then everything would be fine. That's clearly what everyone is after. Mm. So the upstream signals that trigger the regenerative potential <coughs> of cells are really where people are working very hard. Sorry, the, with the glass, please. I'm very much a layman here. So I was curious, now you say that if you have, if you can solve the regenerative problem, how does that then affect the immune response? Say, say we have a young <coughs> child who you can somehow regenerate their heart. Would they then be more open to infection because their immune response would be suppressed? Or is there going, is there going to be a trade-off at some point at this level? Regenerative versus immune? Because you seem to be saying that these species which have a good regenerative pro properties don't have such good immune response and vice versa? Oh, well, I think it's a matter of, I mean, I'm James is the expert in this but I think it's a matter of like any medicinal correction of um, for localizing if the immune system needs to be prevented from occurring in a particular way or, or actively promoted, it would be a pharmaceutical intervention that locally produced that in the regenerative <coughs> tissue you wanted to regenerate. So, for instance, if you didn't want um, macrophages there, you would have a, a drug that stopped them coming at a particular time, and that would allow the window for the regenerative potential to occur. I don't think anyone would be modifying a patient's um, you know, genetically coded immune system. Sorry? No, I won't want to shim. Well, shim yeah. it wouldn't get FDA approval. <laughs> 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 uh, there's, a, there's a question up the back. Uh, do you see there to be a, for regenerative medicine a sort of hero front runner or more of a, a role of an interplay between things like stem cells or, or patterning molecules or things like even platelets and, and macrophages related to sort of scarring and fibrosis? Um, or do you think those need to work together with genes that inherently are responsible for regeneration that we can bring across from other species? Or um, is there an area that you're sort of leaning to? Over? And is Army open for collaboration? Well, <laughs> of course. So we, our director and myself, use the term regenerative medicine to encompass all the things you just said. It's not regenerating organisms. It's not stem cells. Stem cells is definitely not regenerative medicine. It's a tool that we use to understand and provide therapeutic avenues for research. But regenerative medicine is, is what was said at the start. Anything that can be utilised to engender regenerative potential in injured or damaged tissues. That's what we're interested in. And we'll I talk guess, to yeah. anybody who can help us do that. I guess my research is an example of that. You would not necess necessarily see the link between how we can you know, contribute to regeneration when you're working on such basic evolutionary mechanism or comparing genomes, but we start to see it now. We've managed to get all this information and as I said, it's a whole system that works together. So I do believe that, you know, from electric fields to, to platelets to macrophages, it, it's all going to be one system integrated to promote regeneration. Signal and it's signaling molecules. Yeah, and signaling yeah. molecules. So it's, um, and, and also to answer your question, it's going to be challenging, you know, to to, to really not ignore all these different aspects when you want to find a cure or a, a drug that, that induces regeneration because you have to think about all the interplay and the interactions, yeah. It may, maybe just to answer your question more directly, that it, everything you said is done by a researcher at the Regenerative Medicine Institute. We're, we're just one flavour of what goes on, but all the things you just said, you could find somebody there how many researchers have you said? Who? There's 250 of us. So, so, so my, my personal view on the interplay between like what I do and stem cell technology is that it really is quite compatible. So in salamanders, when you amputate the limb, you, you form this pool of progenitors. They're not pluripotent stem cells like you would buy from, from mesoblast or, or whoever, 
but they are sort of less differentiated than the mature cells they came from. And that process is basically in vivo reprogramming, right? But it's natural. It's been going on for, you know, for eons. Uh, so there's a lot to learn about how that process happens very naturally and coordinated. Uh, and I think that all of the genes that you use to reprogram cells from mature cells into stem cells are upregulated in naturally in the salamander. So there's a lot of parallel there. But one problem with stem cells is that they really haven't been able to be put into a patient and engraft and actually become part of the host tissue. They sit there and they do good things because they give a paracrine signal and they dampen inflammation and they probably attract macrophages and all those sorts of things. But they don't actually integrate into the tissue. So Perhaps with the exception of hemophilic yeah, stem cells. Yeah. Well, well I, I mean, you know, in the commercial <laughs> stem cells that you would buy for arthritis. Well, and, or, and there well, are no proven... Yeah. Exactly. Mm, commercial stem cells but, available. But actually get, <laughs> understanding that link between progenitor cells and functional integration with a neural circuit, you know, with other cell types, with tendons, those sorts of things. Like, I think there's a lot to learn there, and I think they're both compatible fields. Yeah. Just, I think the last question here, I'm mindful of oh, the time, I'm sorry. You. I don't know if the two are related, but obviously the process of uh, regenerative repair or growth uh, has to come to an end, which would be controlled. Uh, our heart doesn't keep growing, reaches a certain stage and stops. Mm -hmm. Just wondering, is the incidence of cancer in, say, axolotls higher than in vertebrates? Well, that's, that's fascinating uh, as a question because it seems that salamanders are relatively resistant to regeneration within field, sorry, resistant to cancer within fields of regeneration. So you can put a benign neoplasm uh, on the back of an animal uh, and it's fine. You put it on the arm and it basically uh, won't grow. Uh, where well, you put that on a frog and it will spread. So they're quite, there's something about regenerative fields, such as the arms or, or wherever in the eye, um, that wherever you regenerate, you don't get cancer. But if you, you know, so if you inject mutagens into the eye, the top part of the eye will form a lens, the bottom part will form a cancer. So there is something strange about how those two intersect, and I think they must share overlapping signalling in some way, and that has to be explored at some point. One of the theories that I don't think has any experimental validation is that you know, regeneration can cause cancer, and therefore you know, you lose it if you don't want to be um, you know, at advert, avert risk for forming many types of cancers. I mean, all these regenerating organisms up outside their regenerating fields form cancers anyway, so it's not like they can't form cancers. But that is one theory that's been put forward, mm -hmm. that the flip side of regeneration is, is the fact that it can go wrong and be cancerous. But there's really no evidence of that in regenerating organisms that do do. Yeah. The heart actually is an interesting example because you don't hear much of heart cancer. And yet, you know, the zebra fish, you can see there is a lot of regeneration going there, but there is no heart cancer either. So these are more arguments towards the fact that maybe they're actually not linked, they're the different processes. Mm -hmm. So we don't know, but it's, it's, some, it's avenues to definitely be explored. Okay, okay. so I'm going to ask you now to join me in thanking our speakers, Pete James. <laughs> I'd like to obviously thank each of our uh, uh, presenters and Megan Muncy for uh, making this uh, uh, event possible. In closing, I'd like to thank the network uh, sponsors. Their, their support makes, makes these uh, events possible. So without their support, we wouldn't be here. So please join with me in uh, thanking our sponsors and acknowledging their incredible uh, generosity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, the audience, for attending and supporting this event. Uh, thank you and good evening.